we will be live any second now. So okay. please go ahead and uh, take it away. Okay. Do we need to record this also or? No, okay. I think it's, it's okay. on YouTube Perfect. for posterity. Okay. <laughs> Great. Um, well, then, welcome, everyone. We'll get started so that we have enough time um, to hear from both our speakers and hopefully have some discussion at the end. Um, this week, we thought it'd be nice. So, um, you know, a lot of these seminars are looking at what's next following the Van Allen probe mission. Um, and so we thought it'd be nice to look at two recently selected SMEX mission concepts that are relevant to our community. Um, there were four missions selected, two solar, and then two more magnetospheric. And so we'll hear from the PIs of both of those mission concepts today. Uh, so first, we'll start off with Mike Limon. Um, uh, so I'd say go ahead and share your screen. Um, how we've done this before is uh, let both presenters present, and then we'll save all the questions and discussion for the very end. Um, but as we go, if you want to put questions in the chat, you can, um, you're welcome to so that we have them there for later. Um, Mike Limone is a professor at the University of Michigan. He's also associate director of the Advance program there, which I looked up just before this, which um, promotes faculty diversity and excellence, uh, recruitment and retention. Um, he's the former director of the Space Institute at University of Michigan, and he's also been a member and chair of the Heliophysics um, Advisory Committee, uh, JGR Editor-in-Chief, and um, GEM Steering Committee Chair. So he's uh, been a leader in the magnetospheric community in a number of different ways. And so today he'll be talking to us about the mission concept called MAX. So go ahead, Mike. Hello, thank you all for having me. Um, yeah, so MAX. <clears throat> is, oh, I got to click on the right screen thing here. Uh, Max is about the Aurora. Uh, the Aurora is beautiful. Uh, I think that it's been uh, held in wonder ever since we first looked at it. Uh, but not only does it accompany, it, not only is it beautiful to look at, but it also uh, is accompanied by intense space currents and therefore makes it hazardous to Earth. And so it's a, on a space weather side of things, it's interesting for us to uh, to study it and uh, makes it a, a an intriguing uh, space weather uh, topic for us. <clears throat> Just a little bit of uh, beautiful pictures. Um, this is not me, but uh, I'm glad that somebody is willing to go out and camp in the snow in order to get pictures like this uh, of the aurora. That would be that would be a cold night out there. Um, uh, so maybe you want something that's indoors. Um, look at the size of that satellite dish. <clears throat> I'm, I hope that they actually get out and enjoy the aurora. And hey, maybe they did because this photo was taken. Um, although I do see what looks to be somebody playing the guitar or something down here in the uh, <clears throat> in the lower picture uh, part of the of the image here. But beautiful aurora uh, can be seen at the higher latitudes. Uh, and uh, sometimes you can see it from space. Here's one from the International Space Station. Sometimes they uh, think to look out one of the port windows and take a nice picture uh, of the aurora. This is one where you can really see the different color bands uh, coming in. Uh, and this also gives you a feeling of, of the altitude distribution of where this happens. Um, <clears throat> you can really see how it's uh, stratified in, in different colors with the red happening high high up in the ionosphere and uh, the greens and blues down lower in the, uh, in the atmosphere. And then the thin layer that we actually breathe uh, only a few kilometers wide, right up next to the surface. Um, it's highly structured. And, you know, something, uh, the complexity that you can get here, all these little twists and turns and, and small bright spots next to, next to weaker or, or, um, dark spots in the emissions uh, from the precipitating particles is a, a very complex system uh, that is uh, something that would require an investment far bigger than just a small explorer program. But I think that a mission to observe the aurora would be an indip indispensable leap forward for us. Um, so one last one, eye candy, uh, <clears throat> just because I wanted to include it, and that's uh, pictures from Iceland. Uh, I didn't make it to the uh, to the Magnetotail conference in Iceland, 
um, that was there, but this would have, <clears throat> would have been a great time uh, to go and see the not only the Aurora, but Aurora and Lava at the same time. That would be <clears throat> uh, a fantastic trip to make at some point. But even when you're in Iceland and seeing the Aurora regularly, it's still only one skyfall of Aurora. And so it's good to move to space uh, and not just uh, low Earth orbit, but um, higher altitude orbit. And so NASA has been flying missions uh, to go to that higher altitude and see the full rural oval um, for 40 years now. Uh, so, <clears throat> so we have this image here from uh, Dynamics Explorer 1 uh, in, the, in the ultraviolet. Um, and uh, you can see the day glow over here and then the nice auroral oval thin on the day side, uh, thick on the night side, several uh, features here, <clears throat> a bright equator word, uh, a rural edge, as well as some poleward features uh, lighting up the, uh, the night side. We've flown only a few missions uh, that have had these types of auroral ovals uh, imagery on it. Uh, DE-1 is one of them. It had a spin scan photometer. DE-1 was a uh, was a spinning spacecraft, and so it would make a measurement uh, once per spin as it was going through. Um, and it took it took quite a long time for it to develop enough uh, enough uh, photon count to get uh, to get a good a good image from that. Uh, then came Polar. <clears throat> Polar was uh, had two. Uh, instruments on it. Uh, one was the visible imager um, that also carried the UV Earth camera. And then there was UVI, um, uh, which had uh, which had filters on it in order to get different uh, bands within the ultraviolet range. So it, <clears throat> it took uh, separate pictures there. Um, if you remember, Polar um, had both a, a spin platform as well as a despun platform. Um, but unfortunately, it wobbled just a little bit, and so the so it had to it took pictures instead of instead of taking the the for UVI at least instead of taking images uh, with that wobble smearing it, they would take images only from from one part of the uh, of the wobble, and so it it had a uh, a particular cadence that it could have. It had images for a few years. Uh, that's really good. But our last full image of the auroral oval was late 2005. It's been 18 years uh, since we've had this type of imagery. We learned a lot from these missions. So one of the biggest things that you get from that is a time sequence of the full uh, night side auroral <clears throat> um, emission uh, uh, zone <clears throat> and how it develops during, especially say, substorms. Uh, you can see the growth phase uh, thinning <clears throat> equatorward motion of it, and then the expansion phase uh, as it as the poleward edge moves moves up, the uh, westward and eastward traveling um, surges from that, and then the recovery phase as it as the uh, equatorward edge moves back poleward. So that sequence, which had been seen from the ground <clears throat> um, uh, way back when, <clears throat> and uh, carefully put together, and in, in Akasofu's famous paper putting together the auroral substorm sequence, uh, truly amazing to be done from the ground. <clears throat> we could really confirm that and investigate the details of that uh, from auroral imagery. So, so this was a big leap forward uh, on having uh, the full-scale auroral images available to us. Um, it also, because it's precipitation, you can compare these uh, these emissions uh, with uh, Low Earth orbit satellite measurements of the precipitation, and compare uh, what you get from the emissions with the um, uh, with precipitation. And this was a nice paper. Uh, just I'm just picking out a few examples here. <clears throat> uh, a nice paper that that um, did a big comparison of many different um, empirical models of precipitation against UV um, imagery in order to in order to quantify the the goodness of those empirical models against. Uh, against the emissions and also to test um, that uh, calculation from from emission to precipitation and back again. And they were all okay, but um, uh, none were were fantastic. Uh, another uh, thing that you can do with this is deriving ionospheric quantities. Uh, so this top one row is the um, are the the images, uh, the UV images 
uh, from Polar uh, in this case. And then, and then we have one which is the uh, derived quantity directly from that. And then these other ones are all from numerical modeling uh, of the ionosphere thermosphere system. And so given these inputs, you can, you can understand quite a bit about, about the dynamics of the ionosphere, the energy input to it, and the, the relationship of those, um, of those global scale uh, energy flow through, the, uh, through geospace. Um, and in particular, how it interacts with the upper atmosphere of Earth. Um, mesoscale features can be seen in these auroral imageries. Especially, uh, what I, I like this uh, paper by Uritsky, I wanted to highlight that one here. Um, <clears throat> looking at small scale features uh, in the auroral ovals uh, and then carefully calculating a, a particular area size to it and then tracking it through time. And that's that's this picture here, trying to show that uh, that tracking and getting an overall area time integral of the auroral feature. And when you line those up and check out the frequency of those uh, of those auroral features on that scale, um, you end up with nice uh, nice power law distributions. And and uh, Vadim's conclusion from this was that the single slope suggests a common physical phenomenon uh, for small scale auroral features. Uh, which means that you can understand plasma sheet dynamics by uh, by examining the the uh, spatial temporal history of these uh, emissions coming from the uh, the night side auroral zone. There were a few images uh, when we had polar and image up at the same time uh, where the two were uh, conjugate and being able to view the two hemispheres uh, simultaneously. So I just grabbed a couple papers from here. One is uh, this one by Matt, uh, where the northern hemisphere had essentially uh, no features in its um, in its auroral structure, and the southern hemisphere uh, was had these uh, bright spots uh, associated with it, not seen over here. Um, and so that's uh, his particular investigation uh, found that this was due to a low altitude instability. Um, but this is the type of thing that you can do when you have uh, imagery from both uh, hemispheres simultaneously. <clears throat> Another one that you can do is map similar features. For instance, in this uh, in this paper, it was mapping the uh, open closed field line boundary uh, between the two hemispheres. And so this, uh, you know, one is from uh, it, uh, image, the other one is from polar here, and then putting those uh, those open uh, having uh, there are various methods for determining the open closed field line boundary uh, from the poleward edge of the auroral oval, and uh, then putting those two on top of each other, you can see that they don't always match. And well, the the overall flux hopefully matches <coughs> uh, pretty closely, but the the shape of it does not because you can get reconnection in the in the tail especially uh, that can be offset from each other. The issue, though, is that we only have a handful of these types of uh, of images. <clears throat> uh, the conjugate images, it was really only uh, maybe a few dozen. Uh, and the times when we had the full oral oval like this, where you could see it, a full open closed boundary, you can see some of these are just barely clipping it. Um, it was uh, it was a very small number. And so we were able to do case studies, but <clears throat> uh, but there there hasn't been a systematic investigation of uh north south um auroral features how they map uh with each other and and um really understanding the the full nature of the 3d energy flow through the geospace system so that is where uh max the magnetospheric auroral asymmetry explorer uh would fill uh, a gap in our understanding uh, this would be two observatories in uh, circular polar orbit, uh, each with a UV imager uh, at a fairly high spatial and temporal resolution in order to understand the time development of these asymmetries uh, at both the global and the mesoscale. Uh, first part of that would have the two at 90 degrees separation so that you could uh, see uh, they would they would both see the northern hemisphere, then then see uh, one north, one south for a little while. This is kind of the configuration we had with 
uh, image and polar, and then both would then move to the south. The big thing here, uh, not only would you see uh, north and south conjugate um, oral ovals uh, for brief um, intervals here, but the big thing here is that there would be no gap between one leaving the north and the other one entering the south, that there would be that overlap there so that you would have 24 seven continuous coverage of one or the other uh, full oral oval. And that would allow for a whole new level of long duration uh, investigations into energy flow through the geospace system. A second half would move them to opposite uh, sides of that uh, uh, of the orbit trajectory, and therefore you would have extended periods of time where the two spacecraft would both be viewing the full oval um, north and south simultaneously. <clears throat> and again, this would allow then for that open closed field line boundary study like we were seeing earlier, uh, but on a far more extensive uh, database than we have ever had before. <clears throat> and uh, so with that, uh, I see I should keep moving on. Um, <clears throat> the uh, Max Science team, uh, we have people from a number of institutions here. Um, the two uh, big ones with the most uh, science investigators uh, on it are the University of Michigan and NASA Goddard. Uh, University of California, Berkeley, um, of course, is involved in this, as well as many others at different institutions. All of these people are experts in auroral physics. Uh, the uh, project management and systems engineering um, would be done with Southwest Research Institute, which is a partnership that Michigan uh, has been developing over the years. In fact, uh, <clears throat> we have a successful Earth Venture mission, uh, Cygnus, uh, which is eight spacecraft in low Earth orbit, um, measuring GPS signals reflected off of, uh, <clears throat> off of water, off the ground. Um, and you, from that, you can tell sea surface roughness depending on the on the scattering that you get in that signal and sea surface roughness is proportional to wind speeds. So, so the C in that is cyclone and it's a way to see inside of hurricanes. Uh, that was the big um, uh, science objective of Cygnus and it has done very well at that uh, seeing <clears throat> uh, as well as other uh, new things too. So Cygnus is our, is our partnership with uh, Southwest Research Institute and we are building on that same um, partnership of, of uh, project management and systems engineering. So a little bit about the science of MAX. One thing that we would do is go after large scale energy flow, uh, especially looking at that open closed field line boundary and how that um, uh, seeing the day side shift, uh, revealing the uh, reconnection with the sun and then the night side <clears throat> of the OC FLB shifting. Uh, showing energy release into the magnetospheric system uh, out of the lobes onto the closed field line system and uh, through the geospace uh, inner magnetosphere and ionosphere thermosphere at that point. Another thing that we would do is mesoscale features. Uh, we can we will be able to resolve even better than these images uh, <clears throat> bright brightness uh, in the emission patterns. Um, and you know some this study here, uh, another Londal paper actually uh, showed that showed that you could get one to two hours of separation in these uh, in these auroral features uh, that they think are the same the same type of of brightening, but they were shifted because of uh, solar uh, solar wind IMF by twisting of the tail um, and uh, other related phenomenon as the particles came down the field line in the two hemispheres. Um, ionospheric uh, convection plays a role in this, as well as um, <clears throat> as well as uh, the uh, base conductivity within the the two ionospheres, and so that's something that we can extract out of uh, the Max observations and uh, be able to compare these with the mesoscale features and their development through time, and map that back to um, uh, plasma sheet phenomenon. Max over its over its uh, um, prime mission lifetime, will develop over a million new images of the full oral oval. And so this will be a database uh, that <clears throat> uh, at a higher uh, spatial resolution than we've had before, 
that will allow us to, to really explore the connections uh, between auroral features and their drivers. Uh, and so uh, I think that this will provide the measurement set needed for that next generation of auroral prediction modeling. Um, before I wrap up, I'd just like to say my quick acknowledgments uh, to the full team of people that I mentioned earlier, as well as I'd like to make a quick land acknowledgement that the University of Michigan is on uh, is located on historic land of the uh, Anishinaabek, the Ottawa, Chippewa, and Potawatomi uh, peoples, and that this land was often uh, taken from those people in unconscionable ways. And while we cannot change the past, uh, knowing about this, uh, we can strive for a more equitable and sustainable future. So I encourage you all to live at peace with nature, respect the honorable harvest, and support Indigenous nation sovereignty. So let's go out and see the aurora. It's beautiful and inspiring, and knowledge about this is critical to geospace, uh, and not only uh, Earth, but also other magnetized planets. <clears throat> so we have never had a mission to fully systematically view both full auroral ovals, either continuously or simultaneously. So max would be uh, one that would do both of these firsts. So I hope that we get to continue past phase A. Thank you all very much. Great, thanks so much. Um, okay, so we'll we'll move on to our second speaker and then hold questions and discussion for the end. Um, thanks, Mike. So next we'll hear from Robin Millen, if you wanna share your screen. Um, she's a professor at Dartmouth College, my alma mater. Um, she's also PI of the real CubeSat and um, was PI of the barrel balloon campaigns. Um, she's currently co-chairing the Heliophysics Decadal Survey Committee and um, the Coast Bar Roadmap for Small Satellites. So um, she's held a number of leadership positions and, and mi led missions um, studying particle precipitation into Earth's atmosphere. So we'll hear from her next about the cinema mission concept. All right, thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to tell you about cinema. Um, so in a nutshell, cinema is a constellation of nine CubeSats that will study magnetotail dynamics from low Earth orbit. And I'm hoping to convey to you how we're gonna do that. Um, just for context first though, uh, this is our favorite uh, cartoon textbook picture of the Dungey um, convection cycle in a solar wind driven magnetosphere like Earth's. And of course, um, solar wind magnetosphere coupling happens through day side reconnection, um, which is strongest uh, and this coupling is strongest during southward IMF. The energy and magnetic flux are transported from the day side to the night side um, and then back towards the Earth um, through the magneto tail. Of course, this uh, this cycle, this convection cycle, gives rise to a lot of um, global processes such as substorms, generation of, of field line currents, and, and so forth. And cinema is going to attack the, the magnetotail convection part of this uh, convection cycle. And in particular, um, because it's a critical step because of the variability that the plasma sheet adds, which you can kind of see a hint of in this Gamera simulation. Uh, and we know that magnetotail convection operates in different regimes. It can be steady, um, a steady convection for, for hours long intervals, um, or energy can be loaded into the tail and, um, and then explosively released, for example, the substorm. And it's been a longstanding question how the magnetotail maintains steady convection and when and how it decides to uh, transition to this more explosive uh, regime. And uh, and this has been a difficult problem, um, and we've learned a lot about, um, about processes occurring in the tail from in situ uh, missions like Themis. Um, but it's a difficult problem because it's it's really multi-scale in nature, and um, and there's coupling between those different scales. So there are, uh, we think, features in the magnetic field, which I'll say a little bit more about later, um, that are, are sort of tail-wide, uh, large-scale features. Um, we, of course, have observed, oops, um, oops, I'm having to go back. There we go. Uh, we've observed mesoscale. So a few RE um, Earth radii wide features, uh, such as uh, bursty bulk flows. And um, we know that these are responsible from Themis observations for, for the bulk of Earthward plasma transport and also for dipolarizing the magnetic field. And in these, uh, in these flows, uh, dipolarization fronts, um, at the nose of these flows, plasma uh, uh, kinetic scale plasma waves have been observed, um, also by by MMS. 
And so those, um, those plasma waves uh, can play a role in, in uh, interacting with energetic particles as well. And so there's a cascade um, from these large scales to the small scales where the energy gets dissipated um, that is difficult really with, with a limited number of, of infantry measurements. So understanding the relationship between these uh, processes happening at the, these different scales uh, is really what we're trying to go after. And uh, cinema does that with the overarching goal to understand the role of plasma sheet structure and evolution in Earth's uh, magnetospheric convection cycle. And um, we do that by addressing three different science objectives that attack these different scales. So at the largest scales, we'll uh, remote sense the large scale structure and evolution of the plasma sheet, specifically the magnetic, um, the structure of the magnetic field uh, dur in, during these different types of, uh, when these different kinds of regimes of convection are operating. So during SMCs and, and also just in the lead up to a, um, prior to a substorm. Uh, we'll also look at the link between that large scale structure and mesoscale dynamics by looking at auroral mesoscale um, features. And then finally, um, looking for particle precipitation that may be caused by waves that are um, in these uh, in the dipolarization front or the fronts of these uh, mesoscale BBFs. And so how do we do that from low Earth orbit? Well, of course, uh, energetic particles follow the magnetic field line, the small pitch angle particles, and they sample the full uh, magnetosphere as they do that. And because energetic particles have large gyro radii, they're susceptible to scattering, curvature scattering, where their gyro radius becomes comparable to the curvature of the magnetic field, um, or vice versa, the, the curvature of the field is comparable to the gyro radius. And this is an energy dependent phenomenon because the energy dependence of the gyro radius and also is different for electrons and protons. So that the, uh, the scattering um, that's happening because of curvature in the tail uh, causes kind of an imprint of, of what the magnetic curvature in the magneto tail is um, on the pitch angle distribution of the particles. So by sensing the pitch angle distribution at LEO, we can infer information about the magnetic field structure in the tail. Um, um, and we do this from LEO for a couple of reasons. One is because we can resolve the loss cone and we can actually measure the pitch angle distribution uh, at, at small pitch angles well. Um, but also there's another reason, and that is because a LEO satellite crosses magnetic field lines really quickly. So you can see here that as we, uh, we're gonna be in polar uh, near sun synchronous orbits, and as we cross over the pole, we uh, cross those magnetic field lines that map out to a, a vast volume of the magneto tail in just a couple of minutes. And by having multiple spacecraft, we essentially are getting scans of the magneto tail um, uh, over and over again to track the evolution. So each of the spacecraft will carry an auroral, uh, a fairly simple optical auroral imager, um, a suite of energetic particle instruments, and also magnetometers. So I'm just going to step through really, really quickly, um, kind of give you an overview of how we're doing these measurements. Um, and uh, I'll start with, with the, the large scale and the, the particle measurements first. Um, and I want to introduce this term magnetic train. Actually, uh, this was first coined, I think, in a paper by Sasha Okorsky. Um, and magnetic by magnetic terrain, we mean the spatial distribution of the magnetic field in the in the central plasma sheet, and specifically the northward component, the BZ component of the magnetic field, which is um, what the curvature scattering is sensitive to. And because of particles, as I said before, their gyro radius, um, when it becomes comparable to the um, curvature of the magnetic field, the particle distribution becomes isotropized. The, the particles become uh, get scattered and the, the pitch angle distribution becomes isotropic. So at a given particle energy, there's a location at which the pitch angle distribution will switch from being uh, anisotropic with the loss cone to isotropic. And this is called the isotropy boundary. This is an example um, shown for pose uh, for electrons and protons at just single energies in each case. Um, and uh, so I'll get into a little bit more detail about this measurement in, in a minute, but this is what allows us to sense the, the structure of, of the magnetic train or the magnetic field in the central plasma sheet. Uh, we're also going to be carrying magnetometers on the, the sp spacecraft, so measuring the, the local magnetic field um, in the ionosphere, we'll, we'll be able to sense field line currents as well. And uh, the auroral imagers will... Um, we're specifically interested in some mesoscale auroral features such as polar boundary intensifications, streamers, and auroral beads, which, which may have a relationship to 
uh, what's going on in the magneto tail or beads may just be an ionospheric phenomena. I think that's an open question that we're interested in in trying to understand whether the, uh, how these mesoscale aurora relate to uh, the large scale structure in the, the magneto tail. Um, let's see. So associated with, I'm going to say a little bit more about the isotropy boundaries in a second, but first I wanted to just uh, drill down a little bit more into our science objectives. So associated with each of our objectives, we have specific science questions we're going to answer. So specifically for at the largest scales, uh, we are interested in the structure of the magnetic terrain under steady convection conditions, and also how that evolves, how the structure of the magnetic field in the central plasma sheet evolves just prior to a substorm, so leading up to a substorm. Um, for the mesoscale, we're interested in how these mesoscale auroral features, PBI streamers and beads, relate to this large scale structure that we can sense with the particle pitch angle distributions. And then finally, um, looking at whether or not, uh, this is a very specific kinetic scale effect of mesoscale dynamics, uh, specifically whether electron microbursts are associated with the rural streamers, which would suggest that Whistler mode chorus waves at the nose of these, um, in these embedded in the dipolarization fronts could be scattering uh, energetic particles. Um, and th this kind of arises out of some observations that have been a bit puzzling to us, both from, from Beryl and Firebird, where we've seen microbursts actually at much higher L than you would expect. So our hypothesis is that perhaps those are actually being driven by mesoscale dynamics. Um, so I'm going to just give you a little more detail about one of these science questions, um, specifically how does the magnetic terrain evolve prior to explosive energy release. And um, simulation, simulations have shown that uh, under different IM, IMF uh, conditions or in solar wind conditions, we there's a different configuration of the large scale magnetic field structure, the, the northward component in the tail. And so this is three examples. This is from Misha Sinoff's 2019 review paper. Uh, showing these different scenarios. And on the bottom here, you can see the profile of the Z component of the magnetic field in the central plasma sheet versus radial distance. And you can see these three different scenarios prior to, uh, this is during substorm growth phase, prior to uh, substorm onset. And in some cases, you see this formation of a, a BZ dip or a dip feature in the magnetic profile. And here, um, these are sometimes called BZ humps. Um, and we don't, they're basically non-monotonic profiles in the the magnetic field, um, the radial distribution of magnetic field. And there's some observational evidence that uh, that these kinds of non-monotonic features exist, um, but they're pretty sparse and, and possibly not very conclusive. Um, and moreover, we don't really, um, one of those is from our more statistical observations, and we don't really know uh, what the evolution is of the magnetic terrain. So, you know, what factors actually lead to the formation of these non-monotonic profiles and, and how, how prevalent are they? Do they happen very frequently? Um, so cinema spacecraft will be essentially inferring information about this BZ profile. We can't measure BZ directly because we're not sitting out in the magneto tail, but we can infer information about the presence of these non-monotonic uh, BZ profiles. Um, and as I said before, we do that by measuring isotropy boundaries and this just goes into a little bit more detail about that. Um, so we think of this as kind of remote sensing of the magnetic terrain, and we're going to be measuring both electron and proton isotropy boundaries. And again, this is where the location where the pitch angle distribution becomes isotropic at a given particle energy. Or likewise, if you're looking at a given location, um, then, the, then there's an, a, a boundary in energy uh, between uh, isotropic and non-isotropic distributions. And so you can see the energy dependence here in this formula. Um, and so this is the, the ratio of the radius of curvature of the magnetic field and the particle gyro radius. So this is a technique that's been used for decades. Uh, as I showed you the example before, and here's, here's another one from Pose. Um, Pose has very limited energy channels. Uh, and, um, and there is also a proxy isotropy boundary. You'll sometimes hear people talk about the isotropy boundary. That's derived from DMSP, and it's really a, a, a proxy with roughly, uh, roughly, I think, greater than 30 keV proton boundary. Um, more recently, ELFIN has done beautiful measurements of the uh, isotropy boundaries. And uh, Wilkins just published a paper um, showing the statistical goes recently. But 
uh, in particular, elfin with elfin data. So if you look at the second panel here, this is the precipitating over perpendicular flux. And this is, I guess I cut the bottom, the scale seems cut off here, but this is versus radial distance. And you can see where the pitch angle distribution becomes isotropic, the red here where the ratio approaches one, and you can see the energy dependence of that. And so by measuring the uh, pitch angle, basically this ratio of, of precipitating over trapped um, particles at LEO, you can, by look at, at all these different energies, you can you can see this depend, energy dependence of, of the isotropy boundary. So even though we've been looking at isotropy boundaries for many years, we really haven't had the, the kinds of measurements that extend over a wide energy range um, to be able to get the full profile. So that's what cinema is going to bring. Um, we'll also have increased sensitivity, and we're measuring both electrons and protons. And finally, the multi-point measurements by having nine spacecraft allows us to track the evolution of the isotropy boundaries, which hasn't really been done before. So I'm going to give you a, a very sort of simple toy model picture of how this works in a little more detail. Um, and this is a model plasma sheet with a narrow BZ minimum feature. So this is a profile similar to what I showed you during growth phase. This is actually during what would be expected during an SMC event. So there's this dip in the magnetic field versus radial distance uh, profile at about 10 RE. This was a, a simple model just created by taking a SIG and model magnetic field and then superimposing a, a current disk on that to create this dip feature. And if you look at where the isotropy boundaries uh, will occur for a single energy, um, and this is where this, condi where this condition is met, if you just look at electrons at 55 keV, then again, looking as a function of latitude at LEO or at radial distance uh, as it maps to the tail, there are these pink dots here show locations where the, the pitch angle distribution would become isotropic because of the magnetic field curvature. And so you see this transition between isotropic to anisotropic, meaning there's a loss cone to isotropic filled in loss cone, and then back again. And that's because of this presence of this dip in the magnetic field. So that's how we, we uh, sense the these kinds of non-monotonic features. We can also say something about how stretched the magnetic field is from these measurements. So this is a single energy. Um, but you can see if the dip is occurring at a particular location, you may or may not catch it with that one energy. So instead, what we do is we make measurements over a wide range of energies and also taking advantage of the fact that protons and electrons, the mass ratio um, means they have very different gyro, radi gyro radii. So on the bottom here, you show the full energy range and two species that cinema will measure. This is, again... Uh, the radial profile here, but now the black curve here is the location of the isotropy boundary um, oops, uh, uh, for each of these energies. Um, and you can see how it transitions in the inner magnetosphere from uh, the boundary being sensitive, or protons being sensitive to the boundary, they become isotropic uh, in the inner magnetosphere. And then as you move further out, you see the electrons becoming isotro isotropic. And um, again, these pink dots here are just where this 55 keV uh, energy is. So you can see by measuring all these different energies, we can actually map out this, this profile. Um, and I'll just point out that this, this is really spanning uh, six orders of magnitude um, in the energy over um, mass ratio here. So, um, so you really, in order to really fully map out this whole profile, you really need to be able to measure a wide energy range and you need to have good uh, energy resolution as well, which is another uh, ish difficulty with something like pose measurements is in order to resolve the differences here, you really need to have lots of energy channels. Um, so that's what we're going to do with cinema um, is be able to, to scan kind of the, the length of the plasma sheet. Um, so uh, I'll just very quickly um, I just you know, we kind of think about these in terms of the LEO measurements and in terms of magnetic latitude uh, coverage. So each spacecraft is going to acquire a scan of the magneto tail um, in each of its 90 minute orbits. So that's 15 orbits a day, roughly. This is what it maps to in the equatorial plane. But we're making all of our measurements at LEO so we can put these isotropy boundary locations in the same context as the auroral images that we're looking at. And we'll also measure other boundaries like the open closed boundary as well with the auroral measurements, um, actually, and the particles as well. Um, so we get a scan of the magneto tail every 90 or twice every 90 minutes. And then with the nine spacecraft, 
um, we'll be able to track the evolution. And the nine spacecraft are actually in three different orbital planes, and uh, they start out in a string of pearls configuration, so we get kind of a long um, tracking of, of these isotropy boundaries, you know, every few minutes getting another, another profile. Um, but then over time, the constellation will evolve uh, so that we start to get some more local time coverage as well. Um, and so after two years, uh, we have an, an LTAN se separation of a couple hours of local time. Um, so as I said before, the, the instruments are an imager, uh, energetic particle instruments, um, and magnetometers. Um, the particle instrument itself is based on the real CubeSat instrument. Um, and we started thinking about what other kinds of measurements we can do uh, kind of probably two or three years ago with the real um, Tom Sotorellis has done some work with isotropy boundaries in the past and kind of realized that we would actually be able to make really great measurements of, of IVs. Uh, we're hoping real is going to launch uh, any day now. Um, we actually, we're, our current launch date is, is sometime in March. Um, and so we'll, we'll hopefully be able to get some preliminary measurements from, from that. But I'll actually be saying a lot more about the instrument. Um, I have a, a talk at AGU. I'll be talking about this instrument specifically um, and the different science use cases. Um, so I'm going to stop there and I'll let people ask questions if they have them. I just want to give special thanks to all the people involved in the proposal development. Um, I, APL is doing the mission implementation and they have been fantastic partners. And I saw Kieran on here, our project manager. Um, so special thanks to him for keeping us in line. Uh, Berkeley and Space Dynamics Lab are also contributing um, some of the hardware. And I will end with the summary slide, um, but, but essentially uh, we're really, going to be providing the first sort of system level cross scale view of Mangito tail con convection um, and the ability to, to link, as I said before, the larger scale features to uh, mesoscale dynamics and, and some of the um, some of the kinetic scale effects. I will stop. Great, thank you. Um, and thanks to both of you for um, sticking to time so well. So um, it looks like we have plenty of time for questions and discussion. Um, just raise your hand and I can call on you. Um, while we're waiting for people to think of questions, maybe we can start with in the chat. And Matina, I see you have one um, directed to, to Mike, but I, I think both actually, both missions yes. might um, be, be <laughs> I was too to quick to, Yeah, I was too quick to ask the question. Yes, I guess both of them. I would like to hear more about the specific um, resolution of the auroral features that you can, you guys can capture? <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, image FUV had a resolution of 106 kilometers when it was uh, a nadir um, uh, pixel resolution. And I, Max will be significantly better than that. Uh, this is still, um, you know, a, a little bit of a, a thing that we're finalizing over the next year, I'll be able to give a specific answer to that a year from now. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we're also finalizing. Well, we're gonna, uh, we'll, but we'll, of course, we're in Leo, so we will. Uh, I think our resolution is something like eight kilometers, and our field of view. Yeah, is, you're closer, right? Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> our field of view is about six hundred kilometers, so we don't see the whole auroral oval, but as our uh, orbital planes separate, we will actually be able to stitch them together. Our field of view is very similar to what a ground-based imager um, has um, with, with something like an kilometer resolution. Um, and by the way, we're, we're baselining right now looking at 3914 angstroms um, for the wavelength. Okay, thank you. Great, thanks. Um, there's another question in the chat. Um, no one else has one in person. Uh, and this one's for Mike about, um, will Max make any in-situ measurements? At the current configuration, no. It is fully uh, focused on the, uh, the oral ovals and uh, there are opportunities for student collaborations or tech demos on board that will be uh, discussed and decided on. I can answer that better in a year. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I had a question about um, one of the things you mentioned was that you can get ionospheric conductivity from these images. 
Mm -hmm. um, I was curious how well you can constrain it with the, the images you'll be taking and how oh, that works. Well, this, this goes to the Robinson formulas and how mm -hmm. well we believe that or their, yeah. their uh, newer <laughs> um, extensions and improvements that people have been publishing uh, in the last couple of years about about the Robinson formulas. So yeah, from uh, from a dual UV Im uh, wavelength imager, uh, LBH long and short, <clears throat> there are formulas uh, that have been derived in order to get ionospheric conductance, uh, Patterson and Hall conductance uh, from those. It's a it's an estimate, and that's part of our our work. I think prior to launch is. Uh, a serious modeling investigation to improve that so that it can be as as strong a calculation and and a data product as we can make it. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, on that topic, it seems like both both of you will rely pretty heavily on on models to um, fill in the gaps of the observations. Robin, maybe you could talk a little bit about how you'll. Um, uh, partner with modeling efforts to to relate your isotropy boundaries to the actual tail dynamics. Yeah, then that's that will be one of our big jobs during phase A to really flesh that out. I and mean, you saw that very simple toy model that that we looked at. So we have a good feel for, you know, in a kind of uh, very simple configurations, um, what what we'll be able to do, but we'll be um, looking using Gamera simulations. So Slava Merkins on the team and we'll be using those simulations to really do some Aussies to to better understand exactly what our measurements are going to look like for different types of of configurations, um, but yeah, we're we're thinking about that right now, and and you know whether or not there, I think there will be opportunities for kind of actually people have done this with isotropy boundaries before, and actually um, maybe even the UCLA group has been talking about this um, actually having some of the models have tunable parameters and then and using the isotropy boundaries to constrain those parameters so that that kind of thing has been been done with with the limit more limited uh, isotropy boundary measurement so I think that will probably be a first first crack thing that we can do but we'd like to go further than that great um and Mike do you have um any comments on how what models you'll be kind of focusing on to better constrain your your science results and observations yeah with uh with the Michigan crew on here we are focusing on a, a space weather modeling framework but we do have um uh Katie Garcia Sage from uh NASA Goddard and we plan to use a full suite of CCMC uh modeling capabilities uh to to further constrain it beyond what just one model can do. Um, one, one model only gets you so far. So it's good to have a, a collection <clears throat> of modeling techniques and tools. Mm -hmm. um, other questions or comments from the audience? I have a comment. I just like to say that I think cinema is really cool. And I hope that if <laughs> if uh, Max is not selected for some reason uh, for phase B and beyond, that I really hope that it is uh, cinema that is the one picked because it's going to do fantastic science uh, for the geospace community. And uh, Robin's my friend. I do not want this to be a, a big rift in our field. I want everybody to fully support both of these missions going forward. Yeah, I think they're very complimentary missions, actually. So, um, but I would yeah, really like to see a magnetosphere mission go forward as well. It's been, been a while. Fantastic to have both. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Agreed. Um, yeah, I, I had you both speak not as um, competitors, yeah. but more, no, you know, yeah. so that our field can see some right. potential. Yeah, yeah future measurements. We're, we're already planning a drink at AGU next year after we're done. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we hope that both of these, you know, uh, or at least me, I, I hope that, that both of these uh, concept studies that go forward really advance the, you know, the uh, what the capabilities of what we could do uh, for future missions. Um, and, the, and the, the community will be much better because of this next year of work. Absolutely. Great. Um, Shinlin, do you want to jump in? Uh, yeah. So this is a question. Uh, first of all, congratulations for both of you. 
Um, my question is a little bit relevant to uh, um, Robin's mission because you're going to use the same particle detectors in the real. So I'm curious, what's the real? You said a, a manifest will launch in uh, March. Now, do you know what's a launch vehicle? Uh, just curious or not. Yeah, so we're on Firefly Aerospace. We were originally on Flight 3, and then they just launched that actually with the Air Force mission, uh, took that over. Um, and now we're on Flight 5. Um, this just NASA, not not because of us, just the the NASA coordination with, the, and, you know, their first successful, semi-successful launch was Flight 2, and it, they didn't quite get everything into the orbit they wanted to. And flight through was really the first full success. So I think NASA wanted our flight to wait until a little bit more success. Um, with there's a number of CubeSat. It's a it's a CSLI uh, launch. Um, but so currently it's sometime in March is what we're expecting. But you know it will be somewhat contingent on the fourth flight, which is going to happen before ours. So that should happen towards the end of this year. But right now our delivery is in January. So we're gonna be doing, um, we're moving right in, into TVAC really soon and then uh, and then Vibe after that. that. That's very relevant to your cinema as well. Just the whole finger crossed, nothing against the, um, you know, Max, you know, both are good. If you, if you like a real demonstrating your instrument work well, that just probably adding strength to your next phase, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm really excited about real science too. I mean, you know, we're targeting microburst for that and looking at the pitch angle distribution. And Elephant has done a little bit of work, but we'll have a really good time resolution to really fully resolve microburst. So I think, um, so yeah, fingers crossed that things go go well. Good, thank you. Yeah. Great, thanks. Um, any other questions, comments? Um, if not, we can, you know, stay on time, give everyone about three minutes back to their day. Um, I think, you know, overall, thank you both for talking mm -hmm. to us. I know, you know, selections were just made and you're about to ramp up and have a really intense phase A. Um, but it's great to hear about the the science and, and potential next mission for magnetospheric mm -hmm. physics. Um, so congrats and, and good luck to both your teams. Absolutely. Thank you for wonderful presentations and the best of luck to both missions. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. All.